Hey guys, this is Dawn, and we're here at the Gathering Spot, and I'm sitting here with Mr. James Bailey. How are you? I'm better than I deserve. James, <laughs> best day of my life. <laughs> Why is it the best day of your life? Every day is the best day of my life. Every day has new opportunity, always. Awesome. So we have the opportunity to interview you today, and I wanted to just talk about the trajectory of your career, where you started and how you got to this point. We'll go into that in, in more detail, but just talk sure. about where you started. Well, I'm from here, mm -hmm. so I was born and raised in Atlanta, born on Boulevard at Georgia Baptist Hospital, mm -hmm. um, but raised on the east side in Decatur. Mm -hmm. uh, the short of my life is um, I was always an enterprising kid. I started my first business at 12. Okay. Uh, I bought my first house at 19, mm -hmm. uh, made my first million by the time I was 26. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I was 28, I was sleeping nights in a nine by nine storage facility off of Mountain Industrial Boulevard in Tech Tucker. Right. Um, at that point, I learned about the power of significance. I had been by the world's standards successful, but I had zero significance, and I had done nothing to put a dent in this world or change mm -hmm. anybody's life. Uh, so from that moment onward, I, I started chasing significance. That led me to Operation Hope, the organization we talked about earlier. Right. And uh, when I started at Hope, I was in the sub-basement of a building with a broken laptop and a half a cubicle. <laughs> so um, you started with, like, the Amazon, you know, that picture of the Amazon? Yeah, started from the bottom. <laughs> started from the bottom, yes. And uh, actually, John Bryant, the founder of the organization, fired me my second week on the job, mm -hmm. saying there was no need to be in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I left, though, Atlanta had become the global headquarters for an organization that was in 52 countries. Mm -hmm. um, we grew, but again, it was always me chasing significance. And uh, I left and uh, started a, a private foundation, my wife and I, the Phoenix Leadership Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, focused on exposure. It's still in existence today because uh, I think the greatest contributing factor to poverty or poverty mindset, mindset is lack of exposure. Okay. Uh, so we focus on that, one word. Um, I dibbled and dabbled in some private equity stuff and a couple of startup logistics kind of things, but um, to bring me to current and this current opportunity that we may go in deeper with, mm -hmm. um, I had promised my wife two years ago when I left Hope that I'd never get another job. Mm -hmm. uh, and I made her commit to me that she would help me keep that promise. Okay. But this opportunity came along that was a, a dream come true. Okay. I'm the kid that when I was 14 years old, I used to steal my mother's car. And I used to drive around Collier Heights in Southwest Atlanta. Uh, to see the big houses that black people lived in. You were 14 doing this. Oh, that's, yeah, was, yeah, it was a whole <laughs> different interview. Uh, but, um, but yeah, because I, I had never seen it before. Okay. And so this was inspirational for me. And then I heard about this guy, Herman J. Russell, that had a pool in his house in the 60s. Right. And the Dr. King used to swim in it, and, and he had these buildings, and he had made this money, and it was had a company. And uh, he became a distant mentor without ever meeting him. Um, and people in that sphere, I never, I had to go find their stories to be inspired by it. Okay. Uh, but now when I've had this opportunity where the families in, in many ways entrusted me mm -hmm. with carrying that legacy forward for generations, uh, it, was a, it was a job too big to turn down. Okay. Uh, it was an opportunity too big for me to not throw my name in the hat for consideration. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that we're here, uh, as president and CEO of the Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurships, mm -hmm. totally focused on creating the next generation of doers and job creators and innovators. You know, what are we doing to create the next H.J. Russell? Okay. Uh, so this is what we'll be doing here. We've got close to 50,000 square feet of opportunity, and right. I wanted to be the epicenter for economic advancement for black folks around the country. That's amazing. So, and this kind of started with what you were doing at Operation Hope and knowing financial literacy and how important that is to our community and knowing that this month is actually financial literacy it month. Is, so, indeed, indeed. so talk about that. So I think that um, it started way earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been an entrepreneur. The only reason I graduated from high school is because I had a little business growing up. Okay. Uh, so the role of entrepreneurship and that concept of ownership uh, was a quantum shift for me. Okay. Um, I learned the word from my barber. And just like kids in any neighborhood, uh, we are impressed by what we see. Mm -hmm. And one day, I saw it parked illegally in front of my barber shop, my dream car, a black-on-black -black convertible Mustang GT. <laughs> and back in the day, you could have put a Ferrari next to a Bentley, and I'd have taken that car for everything. <laughs> and uh, Immediately, I thought whoever drove it must be a drug dealer okay. just because of environment and who I knew could own that kind of thing. And so I, I actually um, hopped in my barber's chair and 
It was his car, and I asked him, matter of fact, John, I know you're a dope boy. Mm -hmm. And he screamed at me, cursed at me, actually. And uh, told me to shut up and turn around and count how many chairs he saw in that shop. Mm. And I said, hmm, 10. He said, well, each one of these barbers pays me $50 a week to cut hair in my shop, do the math. So I started doing the math. <laughs> this is home. Before you finish, I got two more shops just like this. Finish the math. Oh, wow. So I'm like, zero, 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 uh -huh. comma, and I'm 11 years old. Zero. <laughs> then he finally said it. I was always the kid that used to make popsicles in the ice trays and try to figure out some way to do things and be enterprising, but it never had a name or a face. Mm -hmm. He said it. He said, man, I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Man, I own this business. Mm -hmm. Jay, what you need to do is go find you something you love and go make money doing it. Mm -hmm. Nobody teaches our kids about ownership. Right. It's not really pervasive in our communities. Mm -hmm. So my bike ride home from the barbershop fundamentally changed my life. I looked at everything different. Mm -hmm. That tire shop, who owns it? That McDonald's, who owns it? But public library, who owns right. it? Mom, Dad, do we own our house? We do. Self-esteem, self-confidence goes up. Right. Uh, you don't have to ask me so much to cut the grass anymore because it's our grass. Right, right, right. So really this journey started back then because once I had my company and I was installing car stereo equipment, <clears throat> My aspiration to be successful in business mm -hmm. meant my need for education. Mm -hmm. School became relevant and I took off. AP Calculus, AP Physics, I put parameters around my success that only came from internal motivation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just because my parents were saying do well or my teachers were saying you could do better. Mm -hmm. I was there for my own reasons. Okay. I think that made all the difference. So that trajectory around the power of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. for me started way early on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now talk about your network yeah. because you had to create a network around that sure. and knowing that you had these mentors in your head. Sure. Um, but at the same time, you're seeing other people like yourself who think like you do. Or who could possibly help you get to that next level? How did you go about creating that network? You know, I think it was one of my greatest failures. Mm. I think the way that I fell from, and part of my story too, if we ever had time to like go through the whole thing, is mm -hmm. that when I was making money in real estate, <clears throat> I didn't have a network. I bought into that narrative that you're a self-made man, you get it out of mm -hmm. mud, you do it yourself, you don't need anybody but yourself. Right, right, right. And that's a false narrative. It just doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so when the when I was doing well and when the wind started to change, I didn't have anybody to call on. I didn't have any mentors to kind of say, hey, you might want to pull back here. Maybe you want to do this with your money. So I lost everything. Okay. Um, this whole notion of relationships being the key to success didn't come until later on uh, when I realized that, yeah, I was sitting out on an island and there was nobody to throw me a life raft. Oh, wow. And so, you know, many people that know me know that I'm always preaching relationships matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's the core of any successful organization. Uh, any, and that's why I, use, I, I don't really use the term networking. Okay. I, I build relationships with people because I want, even if I'm talking to a CEO or a janitor, to have the kind of rapport that is, it transit, transcends the transactional. Right. That it actually gets to the core of human emotion and interpersonal connection where actually my struggle is your struggle, my aspiration is your aspiration, and you're in a position where you don't want to see me fail. Mm -hmm. um, those type of relationships will put their neck out for people. Mm -hmm. Those type of relationships will say that I'll do whatever I can to make sure that you get where you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so once that became apparent, once I kind of hit my lowest low, uh, those things started to really realize, like, Jay, you need to start building a uh, uh, a wall, if you will, not to keep people out, but to hold people in. Okay. And so uh, yeah, I started to build from there. And uh, one of my mantras is build as we climb. And I continue to build those relationships. And hopefully I keep climbing. Right. So with you climbing and you're now at the Russell Center, mm -hmm. um, explain more about what the Russell Center is supposed to be sure. or going to be. And then explain how it's okay for you to use your failures to teach oh, the next generation. Absolutely. Because a lot of people are quick to say, well, I don't really want to put all that out there because I'm, I'm successful, you know. No, no, no. But what you, what you just shared is sure. very important and it's key in growing mm -hmm. and evolving as a person. Um, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to have nearly 50,000 square feet of opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russell family was very generous in donating into a 501c3 that was created. Uh, the building where the original H.J. Russell and Company was founded. Right. 
Um, so from this, these, these bare walls, we're going to create what I think will be a world-class business epicenter wow. where we will, in the three words that I've coined, are inspire, educate, and accelerate. Inspire being intentionally first. Um, because I think our people need images yes. of success. They need to walk matters. in <laughs> and have a space and a place that's well done. Mm -hmm. Nothing second rate where they get to hear the journey. But to your point earlier about the failure, mm -hmm. we always hear about the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. But we never talk about the climb. Right. And we want to tell these stories. We want to inspire folks. Folks that are coming from just I got a great idea to people that want to scale their business out to millions of dollars. We need a place where we can go and see elements of us and our reflection okay. in the in the in terms of success right. um so it'll be part museum it'll be a quarter museum if i'm if i have uh -huh. it my way <laughs> where you will continually in every wall and bathroom and nook and cranny get elements of of of, of black excellence and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. we may flip the camera and do a start a story on your paper and your your publication because hey, it's a story right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and people need to know that story yeah but educate and giving people the platform and the roadmap and the sheer knowledge that it takes to scale out a business, to go from ideation to actual revenue producing. Right. Uh, oftentimes we fail because of lack of instruction. Okay. Certainly my story on many occasions where because I just didn't have the information, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have the roadmap, I didn't have the rubric uh, to get to and be successful. But then accelerate. I think we have the opportunity here to galvanize the, the core group of individuals that can supply the funding, the knowledge, the connectivity, the relationships to help business scale up. And I think that when you start talking about in an environment where tech is necessary, and there's a lot of energy around tech, yes, but tech is a small part of our economy. If you want to grow the economy, you just can't focus on tech. Because if we just focused on tech, we wouldn't create the next H.J. Russell. Right. So this will be the place where entrepreneurship lives in all forms. Mm -hmm. And we want to accelerate in wherever we can, in whatever form, getting people the resources they need, connecting them in an environment and an ecosystem that supports their growth, mm -hmm. but then having a space and place that is ours. Right. Uniquely ours and unapologetically ours. Dedicated to minority entrepreneurs and minority entrepreneurs thriving. Now, how do you feel about this concept and this idea um, going to other cities or being in other cities? Because I don't think that there's a lot of representation of spaces like this sure. specifically. Now, I've heard of accelerator programs and some other like tech related programs for minority business owners, yep. but I don't, I don't, I haven't heard of an epicenter, <laughs> you know, like this. So, what do you think? Do you think that this will kick that off? Well, or I hope, so. I hope that that. Very, I can't think of another place yeah. that is land that's owned by black people, building built by black people, mm -hmm. uh, city that is overwhelmingly majority black people, mm -hmm. dedicated to creating black entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be unique in that space. And when I say epicenter, I really want to be that hub that, that shoots out spokes in the community that turns mm -hmm. a much greater wheel of influence. Mm -hmm. So I think Atlanta is uniquely positioned to hold this space for the Herman Russell Center. I think Atlanta is significant because Herman J. Russell is a product of Atlanta, mm -hmm. grew up in Atlanta, created his business in Atlanta, right. and then handed that business down to the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that Atlanta is the, the core of that. Now, will there be things that shoot from this? Hopefully we can be a beacon on the hill. Mm -hmm. I think the greatest thing in the world is if 50 people try to copy Mm -hmm. what we're doing or recreate what mm -hmm. we're doing. That only means that one of H.J. Russell's greatest sayings is collaboration is better than competition. Mm -hmm. And okay. we will have a truly collaborative spirit in this place where there is no competition when you're talking about moving our people forward. If we exist in a space where there's competition in a, in a, in a space where we're talking about moving people forward, we fail. Okay. This collaborative effort, we want to bring people to the table we want to give what we have, we want to instruct, we want to help grow, and we want to set the tone in the culture. We want to curate this experience of excellence mm -hmm. and that everybody has a seat in the table. Right. And so, no, it, it's, I think Atlanta is unique for this space and place, for the Russell Center, mm -hmm. but I can guarantee that the arms that will grow from this body will be far-reaching. That's awesome. So, community-wise, 
how are you going about communicating to the community what this is going to be and really making a connection early on before it gets started? Over the past two weeks, we've had a number of different forums, be it college students from Spelman and Morehouse to entrepreneurs that are in the community. We're having one this week for real estate professionals and we're bringing them into this empty, gutted out building mm -hmm. to get them on the ground floor to get their input about what do they need. That somewhat gives them ownership too because they get to see it from yeah, the beginning. There we go, and it's very <laughs> intentional on my yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to stand on the slab and the dust right. and know that from this, mm -hmm. we, we, we will create something powerful. Mm -hmm. We will create something special. We will start to address the needs in our communities because I'm a firm believer in nothing for us without us. Mm -hmm. And with that, that means that, yes, we can't just build a center and cut a big check and say, here in the community, use it. Mm -hmm. That would be a failed model. I think any model that talks about what people need mm -hmm. has to include the people. Right. And so I am very intentional and very deliberate about getting input and we're just getting started. Right. I think this is the kind of thing where there will be times where I'm spending most of my days connecting with community stakeholders and community members and the folks that are voiceless in most cases right. and seeing how we can be a resource. So it's on the top of my agenda when you start talking about creating an inclusive solution because so often the, one, the solution doesn't really come from us. Mm -hmm. We're usually handed what may be a paternalistic way of, of saying, hey, here's what you need. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. We want to start from the bottom and say we're here for the community. Community, what do you lack? Okay. What is it that you don't have? What are the things that you need? Mm -hmm. And in your situation today, what, did you, what do you wish you had? Right. Um, and start taking all of this information that we collect, all this data collection, and creating a very crisp and clean way forward. Mm -hmm. This is what we do and how we do it. Mm -hmm. But it's born out of input from the community. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So you mentioned one big word that I love to hear most people say, and that's inclusion. Yeah. So there's always this talk about diversity and inclusion. And this is already a diverse space sure. based on how it's created and who it's for. Um, but in inclusion, are you talking more of not someone's gender, but are you looking beyond like mental health issues and disabilities and things of that nature when addressing community issues and being inclusive in that space? Or is it just resources all the way around? I think it's resources all the way around. I think one of the, um, if we look at the city of Atlanta mm -hmm. and have a hard conversation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one that's uncomfortable, if you look at the city boundaries, there are no failing white schools in the city of Atlanta. Right. Uh, there are no Latino ghettos in the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. There are no Asian failing communities or poor communities in the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about these very tough statistics that hit our city around economic mobility and inclusion and equity mm -hmm. and, and you know the, the, the notion that someone has a 4% chance out of raising themselves out of poverty in the city of Atlanta, where Atlanta, yes, we top the list in entrepreneurship and Fortune 500 companies, but we also top the list in income and mobility. Right. We're talking about black people. Yep. Almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. And if we don't start looking at building institutions and programs uh, that address black people specifically, it's not just a black problem. Mm -hmm. The city prospers, an equitable city prospers a more diverse economy prospers. Mm -hmm. And so this should not just be a black problem, this should be an Atlanta problem, and saying that yes, those most affected, let us get them the tools, mm -hmm. the resources, the institutions they need to start leveling this thing out, right. to start decreasing some of these damning statistics that have created this cycle of generational poverty that is keeping Atlanta at a number nine when it could be a 10. Right. Or number seven when it could be a 10. Right. Let's go head on. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about inclusion, yeah, if we're talking about this minority population that is generationally been underserved, all of those other things that you mentioned kind of fall under Bottom that umbrella. Yeah. And so, but we have to be very deliberate about who we're serving mm -hmm. uh, because we want to be very tactical in that approach, but also unapologetic in why we're doing it. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate oh, no, it. No, I love it. I, you guys are historic. <laughs> and I, I could see that there's a place in our building to tell the story of how you're still here. How long have you guys been around? 52 years and, 50, and going. <laughs> 52 years is no small feat. Mm -hmm. 
And at some point, the Atlanta Voice and the whole media group was just an idea. Mm -hmm. And that idea met some hard work, some courage, some ingenuity, some blood, some sweat, some tears, some failures, some pitfalls. And 52 years later, you're still here. Right. That's the story that we need to be able to tell. Because mm -hmm. that's the story that will inspire the next young journalist mm -hmm. or the next young storyteller to mm -hmm. say, you know what? It's possible. Right, right. And if we can get to that kernel of it's possible, mm -hmm match that kernel that's possible with a little bit of belief, mm -hmm. then expose them to what's there already and has come before them, mm -hmm. give them the roadmap on how to get there. Mm -hmm. That's when we start building community. That's what we want to do here. And so this is why these stories must be told right. and why the center can't fail. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much.